I'm Pastor Cameron DeVazier. I'm happy to be here with you today with a message entitled, Aaron, Miriam, and W.A. Spicer. We're going to be looking at some interesting biblical history and then some more recent church history, and most importantly, hoping to find some application for our lives today. But before we begin any study of God's Word, let's begin, of course, with a word of prayer. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day of life. Thank you for bringing us into existence. Thank you for giving us not only this life, but the hope of a life to come to the sacrifice of Jesus. And now, Lord, as we study your word, I would ask that you send us the wisdom that only you can provide. We know that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and so we ask now that your Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth as you have promised, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to the book of Exodus, right there towards the very, very beginning of the Bible, Exodus chapter 4, and we will see God's call to Moses to be his minister. Of course, you understand at this point, the children of Israel have been in Egyptian slavery and bondage for many years, and it is time for them to be led out by an individual by the name of Moses. Exodus chapter 4, and when God calls Moses to be his prophet or to be his spokesman to the people, we'll see that Moses did not initially, in fact, I don't know that he ever really relished the task. In fact, he asked to not be used at all. And Let's just pick the story up in Exodus chapter 4, starting with verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, at this point, the Lord could have said, oh, you know, Moses, you're right. I apologize. I'm sorry. I should not have asked you to be a spokesman when you are not eloquent and you're slow in your speech. But think about the logic of this. If the Lord used someone who is naturally gifted with eloquence and oratory, to be his spokesman, the glory could go to the individual for being such a silver-tongued individual. But the Lord specifically calls Moses because there was no risk of him taking the glory to himself in this aspect. And so when Moses begged off of this task, notice the Lord was not pleased, but we find in verse 11, so the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. So the Lord didn't take Moses' offer of, no, I'm not eloquent, I'm slow of speech. He in fact says, that's exactly what I'm going to do with you, is fix that, the glory will go to me, now you go. But watch what happens now. Verse 13, but he said, that is Moses, said, Oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. He literally tells the Lord, pick anyone else to do this task. Please don't send me. And thus it is that we find, verse 14, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. Already he has the language down pat. He's ready to go as a spokesman. Fine. Bring in Aaron, your brother. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people. And he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And thus we see Aaron enter into the ministry of Moses. Moses was called to be God's spokesman, but he begged off of that particular task. Of course, God did not disuse Moses. No, he continued, but he said, now bring in Aaron. And thus we see Aaron joining in the ministry that God had called for Moses which sets up an interesting study that we're going to go through here, the life and times, just very briefly, some of the highlights, from the ministry, not only of Moses, but from his assistants, Aaron 
and their sister, Miriam. Of course, our message is entitled, Aaron, Miriam, and W.A. Spicer. Now, we'll get to, those, to that last individual in a moment, but let's look at Aaron and Miriam in their work in conjunction with the ministry that God had called Moses to do. So here we see in Exodus chapter 4, the original call of Moses was just for Moses, but Moses had concerns, and Moses asked the Lord to send someone else, and so in compliance, the Lord decides, okay, we'll broaden this work, and we'll bring in your brother, Aaron. Now, there's a close family tie, of course, they're brothers, but also he's eloquent, he can speak well, and he will now be a spokesman along with Moses before Pharaoh. And that's exactly what we see happen. Let's go to Exodus chapter 7. Just go to the right, Exodus chapter 7. And this is what we see happening in verse 1. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. By the way, you see even equivalence there in Scripture between a prophet and a spokesman. A prophet doesn't necessarily have to write Scripture or work great miracles or even foresee the future. A prophet's job is simply to be a spokesman for God. God had originally called Moses to that task. Moses had begged off of that, and so Aaron was brought in. But God still says, no, you're going to speak to Pharaoh, and now we'll use Aaron as your helper, as your prophet, as your spokesman. So it says here, verse 2 of Exodus 7, You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. So here, from the very beginning of Moses' ministry, Aaron is brought in as, if you, for a better term, a sidekick, a helper, his assistant in ministry, his right-hand man, his spokesman before Pharaoh. Moses, however, didn't, or the Lord, I should say, didn't discontinue the use of Aaron as an assistant for Moses once the job of conveying the message to Pharaoh about letting God's people go had been accomplished. In fact, throughout the rest of Moses' life and ministry, Aaron was a close associate working side by side with Moses the leader. Let's go to, say it still in Exodus chapter 7, look at what we find in verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. So we can see that God intended to work through Moses, but Moses had requested the use of Aaron as his assistant. And so you have Moses as the leader and Aaron as his right-hand man. This is established early on, and it continued that way throughout his ministry. Now, the title of the message is Aaron, Miriam, and W.A. Spicer. Let's go back and find out Miriam's role in Moses' life and ministry. Let's go back now to Exodus chapter 2. Long before Moses was the great leader, he started, as we all do, as a little baby. But at the time Moses was born, there was a death decree for all children born, and Moses' parents refused to simply capitulate with that immoral command, and they decided to hide baby Moses in the river, keeping him safe in an ark made of reeds and daubed with pitch. And that's what we find here in Exodus chapter 2, Verse 1, And a man of the house of Levi went and took as a wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she laid him, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And notice now verse 4, the first mention of Mary, even though her name is not used. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. So notice Sister Miriam apparently is the older sister, because we're going to see her come back up later in Moses' life. But here her role, as Moses is a baby, only three months old, in that little ark made of reeds, she stands watch over to see what's going to happen.
But notice that the Lord will use this sister to save Moses' life for the greater purpose God has in store for him much later on. Watch as the story unfolds, still in Exodus chapter 2. Verse 5 records how the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Now watch carefully verse 7. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? Notice it's his sister Miriam's ingenuity, creativity, and resourcefulness in the moment that literally saved the life of Moses. She has this idea, she springs into action, and she says, shall I go get a nurse from among the Hebrew women? And notice verse 8, and the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, because I drew him out of the water. Fascinating. Now this little role actually is a huge thing. She had just been the older sister giving watch care over this basket, but through her, the Lord saved the future deliverer of Israel. Now later on, let's go to the right now, in chapter 15 of the same book, chapter 15 of Exodus, we see Miriam once again playing a pivotal role amongst God's people under the leadership of Moses. Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, after the children of Israel go through the Red Sea and cross to the other side, the Egyptians are destroyed behind them and they give praise to the Lord. Chapter 15 the first 19 verses are called the Song of Moses. Moses leads this great song, this great praise anthem to the Lord for his great salvation and his mighty work on their behalf. But then we find in verse 20 some interesting words. Verse 20, Then Miriam the prophetess. Now recall, Aaron, Moses' brother, was his prophet or his spokesman, before Pharaoh. Here we see Miriam, the sister of Moses, also acting in the role of prophet. And notice this is apparently a prophet of the Lord. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. So here she's a leader among the people, leading them in song and dance in response to the Lord's greatness, in the same manner that Moses had led the people in that great anthem called the Song of Moses. In fact, the Bible has the subtitle there, this is the Song of Miriam. Again, then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances, and Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. So there she is, as they're exiting the, uh, the land of bondage, headed to the promised land. Just like Moses was leading the people in song here, Miriam is leading the women in a similar song, a leader amongst God's people, in fact called a prophetess, right there in Scripture. Aaron and Miriam were family relations with Moses, close associates with him in ministry, and leaders among the people. Watch what we find here in Exodus chapter 17. Some more ways that Aaron was specially called of God. Again, we're going back now to Moses' brother, Aaron. Chapter 17. Now look at verse 8. When the Israelites were at war, watch how Aaron was used by God. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Moses was organizing the troops and he said, I will go up on the hill with the rod of the Lord, this instrument of salvation. So we read in verse 10, so Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and her, that is H-U-R, another individual's name, 
went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down the hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. You notice that God had called Moses to be the leader of the people. He was to observe the battle and not just be a watcher, but participate by holding above his head the rod that he was supposed to carry. But as the battle continued, his arms became weary and they would droop and they would sag. And, and every time his arms would go down, the battle turned against the Israelites. So he had to keep his hands up. And it was Aaron, along with another man, Hur, who brought in this rock and helped him sit down. And then finally they themselves took up that rod and helped lift it up, strengthening the arms of Moses to accomplish the work of the Lord. Throughout his ministry, Aaron was a close associate and vital worker in the cause of God in the deliverance of his people. Look now, by the way, in Exodus chapter 28. Keep going to the right, and as God gives instruction for the work in the sanctuary on earth, we read here verses 1 through 3 in Exodus chapter 28 that Aaron and his sons were to be priests. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Fascinating. He gives him this position of leadership that he had not even entrusted Moses with. Moses was never called to be priest. He was to be prophet. But Aaron was called to this special work of priesthood. In fact, we would find later that he's not only a priest, but he was the high priest. Watch as the story unfolds. Still down in Exodus chapter 28, look down in verses 29 and 30. That Aaron and his high priest had some special, special instruments to wear. Notice verse 29. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart, when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. And you would find out that the Urim and the Thummim, these two stones, were God's method of indicating his favor or disfavor with a question brought to him. And it was Aaron who was supposed to represent the people, not only as priest, but as high priest. He had the stones of the children of Israel literally on his chest and the, on these shoulders, the indicators of God's favor or disfavor. Aaron was highly trusted, highly responsible leader in the house of God. Now, why do I bring this up? Moses was a humble man. He had not looked for this position of leadership, but God had entrusted him with it and said, I will equip you, I will make you what you need to be. But in that work, Moses had assistance. He had a right hand and a left hand, man or woman, if you will, Aaron, his brother, and Aaron's sister, Miriam. Both of them were closely related to Moses, first and foremost, by family bonds. They are biologically close together. But more importantly, they were entrusted with important positions of leadership and responsibility amongst the people of God. Everyone not only looked to Moses for leadership, but also to Aaron and Miriam. They were very responsible individuals, and God had trusted them to a great work. They were close to the head of the work. Moses was the earthly head of the work, and these were his right and left hand individuals. But what we find in Numbers chapter 12 is that at least on one occasion, close was not close enough for Aaron and Miriam. Go with me now to Numbers chapter 12. If you're there in Exodus, then we go to Leviticus 
than Numbers chapter 12. And notice what we record here, starting with verse 1. And keep in mind the great positions of responsibility that Aaron and Miriam had already been entrusted with. But we find this in Numbers 12, starting with verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So apparently they said some mean things about this woman and spoke against Moses, kind of slighting him in the process. And look at their complaint in verse 2. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Now let me ask you a question. Had the Lord spoken only through Moses? Well, primarily, yes, but through his associates, Aaron and Miriam had also been leaders of the people. But notice this leadership position didn't humble them. It actually gave them cause to want more. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And it adds, and the Lord heard it. Friends, this might be a good time to interject. There is nothing that you say out loud or even in the privacy of your own home, heart, and head that the Lord cannot hear. And he understands not only the words that they said, but the motive behind those words. There's jealousy, envy, evil surmising, and they're grumbling against the leader that God had established. Again, verse 2, so they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. And then it adds in verse 3, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who are on the face of the earth. Now was the Lord pleased with what he heard? Of course not. Look what we see in verse 4. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, but not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then, here's the crucial question, were you not afraid to speak against my servant, Moses? You see, for Aaron and Miriam, though entrusted with great responsibility and what would be regarded as high positions of leadership, close was not close enough. They wanted to be even closer to the head of the work. They wanted more glory to themselves. They wanted more honor, more prestige. And in so doing, they spoke against the Lord's anointed. Now, why do I bring this up? Why are we going through this ancient history? Because the simple fact is this. The Lord uses his people to do his work. And the Lord is looking for people who are humble, who are teachable, who are willing, but are not self-aggrandizing, self-promoting, self-centered people. And I'm guessing it was a great disappointment when in the New Testament, Luke chapter 22 records that when Jesus came here to be the earthly leader of his own people, that his right and left hand individuals did the exact same thing. They jostled for a higher place than the one that had been appointed to them. Luke chapter 22, look at verses 24 through 27. Luke 22, starting with verse 24. Speaking of Jesus' disciples, it says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. So as they looked around, all the followers of Jesus, of course, the 12 were already distinguished by being his closest disciples, but even from that closeness to Christ, they wanted to be considered even closer, even greater than all the others. Self-aggrandizement, self-promotion, selfishness was creeping 
and to the work of the leaders of Christ's church. Again, we read, a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And watch as Christ addresses this. Verse 25, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exert lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. He said, don't for a moment consider that the work of God on this earth is just like any other national or political organization. That you put yourself forward as the greatest and the best and claw your way to the top and fight for your rights and try to get what is you believe rightfully yours. Don't worry about who's considered the greatest. He goes on to explain Again, in verse 25, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. Verse 26, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. Fascinating. Christ says to them, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you should not strive for greatness. You should strive for servant leadership. You want to be you considered the oldest and the widest? Be like the youngest. Be the most malleable to my will. Be the most willing to serve in whatever capacity is put forward. Be responsible in the small things, and you'll be entrusted with great things. Now, our message is entitled, Aaron, Miriam, and W.A. Spicer. Let me tell you the story of a gentleman by the name of W.A. Spicer. First of all, to tell his story, we must also mention another man by the name of A.G. Daniels. A.G. Daniels was the longest serving president that the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists ever had. He began his ministry as General Conference president, being elected at the 1901 General Conference session. He began his work in 1901, and by 1922, he was still serving as General Conference President. For 21 years, this man had set as the leader of this great movement of people. So by the time 1922 came around, the General Conference session being held at that time in San Francisco, California, was a stir with the question of should he continue as leader? Should we make this streak go on even farther or is it time for a change of leadership? Well, the nominating committee was split in half. Some wanting to keep Daniels and others looking for a change. Let me explain how this works briefly. At a general conference session of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, all the assembled delegates don't just randomly shout out names of who they would like to see in what offices. They have a nominating committee that goes into a room, discusses all the issues at stake in confidentiality, and then returns to the delegates at large with one name that they would recommend for each office. The very first name they select is that of president. But at this time, as you know, for 21 years, this one man had been president, and the question was, should he continue or should there be another? And the nominating committee went to their work, and after several, I don't know how long, but I imagine many hours, they came back to the delegates, which I believe was the very first and only time in general conference history where the nominating committee failed to bring forth a name. They had no nominee for the office of president. It was too close to call, and they said to the delegates, you choose. So the delegates begin to work in general, doing what the work of the nominating committee should have been, and they couldn't decide either. Someone made a motion and said, this is the nominating committee's job. Send them back into the room and let them do their work and bring us a nomination. So for the second time, the nominating committee convened, and at this point, apparently, Brother Daniels, in his own humility, realized that if his name was not so clear enough to be taken to the floor, or even the floor recommend it, maybe it's time for someone else to serve. Now, at this time, 
going into the general conference session, W.A. Spicer was the secretary of the general conference. That is typically the second in command. The three top officers are the president, the secretary, and the treasurer. And you recall that A.G. Daniels had been president since 1901. Well, W.A. Spicer had been secretary since 1903. So not much less than time than A.G. Daniels. He's been the right-hand man, a second place, if you will, from a human perspective. But what we find fascinating in the story is that as he was away at this general conference session, he wrote regularly to his wife, and he had confided in her as he approached the general conference session that he didn't wish to continue as general conference secretary, but instead, and unlike Moses and, I mean, Aaron and Miriam, instead, he wanted to be a field secretary so that he could be out where the missionaries and frontline workers were laboring. He didn't like the office work. He didn't want a position of prestige and recognition. He wanted to be out in the field doing the work. And so his secret hope that he confided only into his wife that was that as he went to this general conference session, he would be asked to step down from the work, down in the sense that we would consider it, to the work of a mere field secretary. Be put out to the field, go to the laborers and see what's going on there. He wanted to be where the frontline workers were. Well, instead of what would most would be considered a demotion to field secretary, believe it or not, the name that all the nominating committee could agree upon for general conference president was W.A. Spicer. The one who wanted to be stepped down to field service was actually promoted up to general conference president. And what I want to share with you now is the letter that he wrote home to his wife, who he affectionately called Georgie. After being elected to this office, this is what he wrote. I begged all to try to think of some other way, but after a season of prayer, no way seemed open and I could not refuse. I'm sorry for you, dear Georgie. You would not wish it for me. It is so different from the work I long to do, but I just couldn't get out of it without selfishness. Don't worry. It does not call for a superman, but just for a consecrated man doing his best, and that I will be. Dear Georgie, by God's help. And don't worry, dear Georgie. Four years, and I'll have my successor ready, you may be sure. He had no intent on staying any longer than he had to, but in 1926, he was re-elected General Conference President and served until the year 1930. But his letter continues from 1922. So dear sweet wife, I am just your husband that loves you and would rather have the kingdom of your heart than any office honors. And here's the line I want you to remember. There are no posts of honor, but only of service. There are no posts of honor, but only of service. Friends, this is how it should be in the work of God. Whether it's a great work like the General Conference Presidency or just the local work of a deacon or an elder or whatever job that you've been appointed to, whatever task the Lord has laid before you, let us not for a moment consider what would be the next step up. What would be a way I can come, go from close to closer, from, from obscurity to recognition? How can I be? Friends, all of that talk is contrary to the mind and attitude of Jesus Christ. You recall in Isaiah chapter 14 that it was Satan in his fall from heaven where he said, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will make myself like the Most High. It is the spirit of Satan that looks for self-exaltation. But it's the spirit of Christ who had no form or comeliness that we should desire him, nothing in, his, nothing in him that was beautiful that we would be drawn to him. When Jesus walked this earth, People didn't look at him and say, ah, there goes the Son of God. He was humble. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, we are told that he became obedient even unto death. 
and the death of the cross. Friends, when we work for Jesus, we should do so like Jesus. All that we should do, all that we do, should be done humbly, simply, and with no eye to personal gain, but only to the glory of God. This is the lesson that Miriam and Aaron needed to learn. They were close, but they wanted to be closer. They were recognized, but they wanted to be more highly exalted. And in so doing, they reflected the character of Satan himself. But on the other hand, W.A. Spicer, like Jesus himself, wasn't looking for posts of honor. He didn't want recognition. He didn't want self-aggrandizement. He wanted to be a laborer. He wanted to be a worker. And through that humility, the Lord exalted him from what we would consider exaltation, at least, and entrusted him with the leadership of the entire Seventh Adventist World Church. There are no posts of honor, but only of service. Friends, every one of us should be workers in the cause of God. Not for what it should bring to us personally, not for whatever gain that could be brought from it, and not from any recognition or notoriety or fame that we might desire, but from merely the responsibility and the joy and privilege of working for Jesus to, do the, to bear the message of Christ in the very character of Christ himself. This should be our aim. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for entrusting us to work for you. But Lord, in our work for you, help us to never allow self to enter in. Help us, regardless of where we are in our leadership position, whether it's what some might consider highly exalted or others might consider very lowly indeed, help us to never grasp and grapple for a higher place. Help us to be concerned with our reputation, our image, and our popularity. But more importantly than that, Lord, help us to be concerned for your work and your work alone. Help us, to be, help us to be soldiers for you. Help us to be workers for you. Help us to be doers of your word. And help us to do so in the character and attitude and the humility of Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.